Okay, so I'm going to uh, demonstrate the uh, uh, final version of the uh, first version of the clustering tool. Uh, it's been added to Mark Edit uh, for Mark Edit 7. Uh, I don't anticipate making any changes until uh, the tool's out um, <clears throat> for user testing um, in the uh, either in uh, beta user testing or after the, the tool actually is released and it gets into people's hands. Uh, but I thought I'd um, demonstrate uh, how it works because there's some things that uh, uh, hopefully will be um, intuitive but maybe aren't. And so I thought this would be a good opportunity to uh, lay out how this is going to work in case there's early feedback. So the tool will be a standalone tool as well as a tool integrated into the Mark Editor. I'm going to show how it works within the Mark Editor. So we'll open the Mark Editor. Uh, we'll go ahead and select a file. In this case, I'll take this file here. Uh, this file has, uh, if you look, um, just under 15,000 records in it. So the clustering tool is under Tools, Clustering Tools. Uh, you select um, how you want to index the data. Um, I'm just going to index the control data, so I'm going to go ahead and import that. Uh, you see it says it's importing, it's done. Um, I have uh, two predefined options, the 1xx, 7xx, or the 6xx, or if you want to target specific data, and in this case I do. Um, I'm going to target the 100 and the 700. Um, there's probably good reasons to, to be fairly specific about what data you want to cluster since um, uh, overlap I found um, looking at all the 1xx fields, for example, causes uh, a lot of difficulty since you have a lot of corporate headings. But anyways, um, you define what you want to cluster. Um, you have three different clustering algorithms. The default one is lattice and distance. There's a composite and a dice coefficient. Um, the different clustering algorithms will potentially impact which data um, is collected as part of the cluster, um, but you can decide which you want to use and which works best. Uh, I find the lattice and distance works well and it's, it's fairly efficient, um, but uh, you, know, you can try, um, you can actually try the process on all three and, and by potentially I could see based on user feedback maybe allowing people to recluster the data in real time without having to re-go through the process um, uh, once that way you can see the differences. Um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it at the left and spin. Uh, you can decide um, which subfields you want to cluster on. Uh, this is a common delimited list. Um, by default I'm selecting A. Uh, there's some reasons for that. Um, the main reason is that especially looking at names where you potentially could have dates and other values. Um, the subfield A includes the core set of data that you want to look at, um, but you're welcome to add as many subfields as you want to cluster on. Uh, just realize that uh, definitely will change the uh, impact, the how materials are grouped together. Uh, you get to display how you display clusters. So by default, I want more than one value. Uh, I want to actually see groups. So by default, it asks for things that are more than one, uh, but I can set more than five, or if I want to see everything, I can ask for all. So I've got my uh, data defined. I go ahead and generate my cluster. Um, you can see that the cluster gets generated fairly quickly for those 15,000 records. Um, the way that this works is you select the values you want to look at. So I could look here. That looks good. Maybe I'll look at this one because I've looked at it already. Um, so I have four values here. Let's say I want all of them to be that one. I would select the values that I want to edit, um, the value that I want to turn it into, and then I'll tell it to add that update. Now you'll see something that's happened here. In the cluster data tree view, the values that I just selected disappear, um, and you'll notice that uh, the text box has been blanked out. So what's happening is in the background, the tool has registered that as a change. Now I can click the process all changes button and it'll process that change. Um, but then if I want to make any other changes, I'll have to reopen the clustering tools, re-index, re-go through the process. Um, but maybe I don't want to do that. I really don't. I'd actually like to process this data, more than one set of data. Um, if I want to do that, I can keep selecting the values that I want to edit. So in this case, I'll go ahead and select um, this one. I'd like to turn everything into uh, the bottom value here. Um, for the generic value, so I'll go ahead and add that. So now I have two operations that need to happen um, when I tell it to process all changes. It's going to process the changes for the two, two clustered groups that I've selected. And I can continue. I could pick another value here, so I could uh, check this one. That one looks fine. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 
So here we have uh, Keith R, Keith R author. So I think maybe we want all of these uh, to look like this one. Um, you'll see again another another value added. Um, I can go ahead and look down and see if there's any more. Um, maybe I want to go ahead and say that uh, for these that set, I want to change them all to author. Uh, so now I've got that. So I've I've actually added a large number. Well, not a large number. I added a number of of, of changes that I want to have made based on the cluster data. And I can, every time I add an update, it registers a new value to be added, and it removes the, the values that I'm going to edit from the clustered uh, screen. And when I'm finished, um, and I'm ready to process my changes, I go ahead and tell it to process all changes, and it goes and it uses um, some new tools that are in MarkEdit that allow you to do um, this, this batch process in real time. So I'll go ahead and process all the changes. Uh, the changes get processed. It tells me that 30 changes were made um, from the selections that I made. Um, the changes get loaded into the Mark Editor. So now I have the changes here, and I can go and I can look to see if those changes have been made. So we'll go ahead and look for one of these that I know is there. Um, and if we look, we see that that value now has been reflected. Um, I told that I wanted um, are the values to have the author at the end. I wanted to have the date added. So for all of the values where that was there, it's been updated based on the values that I selected in the in the cluster. And if we looked for the other values, we'd see that those are, are there as well. Um, so this gives me the opportunity um, to uh, do not just clusters of data, not just cluster the data for, for evaluation, but actually be able to stack changes um, uh, once the data has been clustered. So I could sit here um, uh, and just keep going through everything in the list um, and, and doing that kind of, um, of editing. Uh, and when I'm finished and I process the changes, it'll happen um, almost immediately, um, or at least you know, on the size of the file, it'll happen fairly quickly. Uh, because what's happening is as the tool um, processes each record, it evaluates whether or not um, one or multiple changes need to be made to it. And it does it all in real time. This is different than the way that the tasks work, which actually do um, individual um, operations. So per task that you set up, each, uh, each operation finishes, reloads the file, and then does the next thing. So that way each task can act upon um, the, the, the finished action for it. Um, in this case, all the actions are happening simultaneously. Um, so it's a very different kind of editing process, and one that um, uh, is done specifically for performance, uh, but I think um, makes a lot of sense for this kind of uh, clustered work, because you're, you're actually, I think, hoping to be able to do um, multiple changes um, and, and stack those changes. I, I can't imagine you would go in and cluster all the data to just make one change to one author. That This idea of, of actually skimming through large lists um, of authors and, and looking at them probably makes sense uh, to be able to do. Um, right now I have, uh, you'll notice that when we when we clustered the data, the data was, was all the, the, t the trees were closed by default. Um, you could set it up so that they could be opened um, there's some reasons not to do that, uh, particularly around performance for really large files. Um, I have a, a large file that's um, uh, a half a gigabyte, and the indexing and the clustering um, happen over the course of less than in between five and eight seconds, which is what I would consider to be acceptable performance for a file of that size. Uh, the problem is that if you open all of the um, trees, uh, they get to be just ginormous and, and a little too unwieldy. Um, and, and that actually does cause significant uh, loading issues. Um, so there's some there's some trade-offs that I've made there for for um, display purposes and, and maybe there'll be some feedback in terms of how to make it easier to evaluate um, uh, which clusters you may want to look at. Are there ways to flag them or something like that? I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but anyways, that's that's what it looks like right now. I'm, I'm actually pretty pleased with how it's turned out. Um, the three clustering algorithms work fine. 
Uh, like I said, I have a favorite, um, but uh, but I've already actually found this useful. I've been uh, testing this quite a bit on, on local data here at Ohio State and been um, relatively interested at, uh, at how uh, easily this has allowed me to identify, uh, especially in the um, uh, 100, 700 space, um, authors' names that, uh, that uh, I had thought were probably a little more um, regular, um, but uh, had a, a significant amount of data that, that could be updated. Um, so I think that's kind of neat. So hopefully folks will find it useful too. Um,